recently posed by Australian life writing scholar Gillian Whitlock when she asked what the turn to new materialisms brings to thinking about life narratives. One thing I hope to develop from this line of inquiry is a vocabulary and a framework that can incorporate uh, marginalized voices into the historiography of 19th century Irish emigration to British North America. And another related thrust of this inquiry is to imagine how to decolonize the archive. Um, and that's part of what I've been thinking about too in relation to fur trade diaries. How do you sort of decolonize um, the deposits that are in the archive? Knowing how much is missing in the archives, how, do, how can we imagine new ways of reading what is already there? So my methodology has been to look at individual examples. Historians Bruce Elliott and Donald Akinson have both argued the advantages of such an approach with regard to the Irish diaspora, with Akinson advising scholars to focus on the migrants themselves without preconceptions or discriminations. So when scholars focus on the phenomena of Irish immigrant letters, some take a big picture approach. Uh, there's Emma Morton at the University of Liverpool, and she's been using letters from uh, Kirby Miller's archives to create this sort of metadata. And, um, and then they do this sort of beautiful, elegant visual mapping of where the letters went and how they circulated. Much attention's also been paid to the so-called American letter that brought to Ireland tickets, reassurances, remittances, with one estimate saying 1 million letters went uh, from Ireland to back to America in 1854. Scholarship has been less attentive to letters written and received north of the American border um, with respect to what I think is obviously a particular cultural climate there. The often unremarked reflections on the material conditions of writing and posting journal letters within the diaries and letters themselves really draw my attention because they reveal particularities of situated everyday life. And I don't think that that is irrelevant or antithetical to a critical approach which seeks to denaturalize settler colonialism and to locate the specific role of Irish emigrants in that pre-Canadian context. So Michael Keneally wrote in 2005 that historiography about the Irish in Canada would be enriched by paying attention to life writing such as letters, diaries, memoirs, autobiographies. One benefit of examining such documents, he said, would be to correct, quote, pervasive notions of the archetypal Irish immigrant derived either from Irish American experience, but also reinforced by specific associations of the Irish famine immigration to Canada. And growing up in Canada, that's kind of the only history that I would know about, right? Growing up there, you only heard about migrants coming because of the famine. As much as true what he says, but the benefits of using life writing as source material go beyond correcting the historical record of Irish Canadian settlement, he says, because they also illuminate the formation and delineation of immigrant identities. Keneally says life writing collaborated layers of subjectivity and delineated nodes of reference of immigrant identities. So how letter writing figures into that calibration as the immigrant becomes a settler is a question, I think, for epistolary scholarship. Uh, and in 2016, Liz Stanley says, exploring letters and recent variants sent to and from a range of historical and contemporary migratory contexts is a central task for epistolary scholarship. So that gives you an idea very broadly of the approach that I take and why I think immigrant letters and journal letters deserve scrutiny. But I want to get into some examples of, of um, you know, how we can think this through with, with some very specific cases. The first one is kind of the least Irish of the case studies I've been working on, which in itself is instructive. Um, Mary Gapper came to England, uh, from England, sorry, to the lands of the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee people, which is now called Thornhill in Upper Canada, to visit her sister in the fall of 1828. There she met and married an Irish man from Cork, Edward O'Brien. In 1832, they moved to a farm and remained there for the rest of their lives. She hailed from landed gentry, um, and she was part of a group of really literate early migrants to Canada um, who probably encountered a lot of the promotional material in the 1820s that was encouraging people to leave England and go specifically to Upper Canada. And that group included people like Catherine Partrail and Susanna Moody, who may be the only people that you could identify, you know, overseas as, as being someone from 19th century Canadian literature. 
they all left a, a lasting legacy. Gapper O'Brien, not so much, but she did leave a whole set of letters. And her experiences tell us something about the challenges of letter writing. She began her chronicle immediately upon leaving England before she uh, got sick with seasickness. And then once she was married and settled, she sent off these journal letters as she could between 1828 and 1838. She comments all of the time on the difficulties of conveying the letters. And there's a published edition of her work that completely eliminates any, any of that discussion of the material history of what she encountered. So that was to me quite interesting. The edition just eliminated any discussion of postal difficulties. So here's one example. She said, I'm going to close this letter and journal, calling it both. If my neck should be long of coming, do not be surprised as it's probable that I shall send it through the quartermaster. Be not dismayed if the two predecessors of this are long on the road as they have been sent by private hands. Honestly, almost every letter in the archives foregrounds the letter and journal as an object which must undertake this postal journey. Uh, fortunately, O'Brien had the sense to take paper with her, knowing she would not find an easy supply in Upper Canada. The first paper mill in Canada was 1826 in a place now called Flamborough, but that was far away from where she lived, and there's no evidence that she got paper from there. All of her extant letters have a watermark from Laverstoke in England, so she brought on, over her own supplies. This difficulty of sourcing paper is also evident in an example I found in Kirby Miller's donated papers at the Moore Institute at the University of Galway. Um, and I had the chance to go down there in uh, March. Irish immigrant Daniel T. Sheehan left documents between 1841 and 47, one of which is a journal letter, which he calls a diary, covering his migration from Bally Longford, County Kerry to locations in Toronto, Barrie and Stony Creek before he settled in Cleveland. He obviously prioritized the paper on hand for diary writing because when he wanted to create a prayer book for himself, he had to repurpose a pack of cards. Uh, in 1859, Martha Wilson apologized about a, quote, dirty sheet of paper she had to use when she wrote from a location just outside of Coburg, Canada West, to her brother George Reed, who was in Belfast, even though Coburg was the third largest center for booksellers and stationers in Canada in, at exactly that moment. So how did the postal system work before 1850? Um, they, the correspondence operated within this culture of communication and um, you know, private, private uh, favors, mutual obligation. There was nothing standard about getting a um, postal traffic through what would become Canada. And so, of course, they they would try to, Mary Gapper O'Brien, what she did was she would squeeze as much as she could onto a really large sheet of paper, fold it up into a kind of envelope, leave a fourth side open for the address, and then uh, this journal, as she called it, obviously would be limited by the size of the paper, and on the front were just various postal directions about how this thing would circulate, and then once it got to England, how would it circulate after that, because it had a set of relatives that it needed to go see, some of whom were in Ireland. Um, so yeah, they were, you know, the, the early letters from her followed that very chaotic route. Things did get a little more settled through the 1830s when letters often went across the border at Lewiston into New York and then on to Liverpool by way of ship letters. If, uh, if a letter is stamped, um, labeled as a packet letter, that means it's going by um, ships owned by the British Post Office, and that's the only way it could be a packet letter. All other forms of mail were, were labeled ship letters. Uh, in 1829, there was actually a post office newly established near her, uh, and um, so then it had a proper postmark for the first time and went to Niagara, New York, Liverpool, and overseas. When Isabella Allen wrote a journal letter to her sisters in Belfast in 1838, she speculates about how mail will get to them in Ireland. And the address on the journal explains that this piece of correspondence went to Liverpool by way of a ship before it went to Belfast. Um, so there were routes, but there wasn't really a settled system. Weather was always a factor in Canada. Lucy Peel, who was the second cousin to uh, Prime Minister Robert Peel, was writing in the eastern townships of Quebec in the 1830s when she commented on the routes of communication during the winter. 
She said, we sent off a letter to you yesterday by the by Quebec, and it's the last you'll receive until next spring by that route because the river will be closed. One team of men who were conveying mail from Halifax to Quebec in a heavy downpour reported, many of the bundles of letters were so completely saturated with the water and ground by the unavoidable friction produced by the conveyance of more than 800 miles that they were little better than a mass of pulp upon being taken out of the bags. So that's a terrible, terrible thing to think of all those lost letters. They said, we used our best exertions to dry the letters and put the broken portions together, but many were useless. Irish woman Elizabeth Foster wrote to Catherine Brown in Navan County Meath that her disappointment in moving to uh, Quebec from Kingston was alleviated by the fact that she would receive letters in a much shorter period than we have hitherto done. She meant that her letters would no longer have to face a really long, difficult overland journey before they hit the um, before they hit Quebec and then Halifax. Halifax became a year-round packet port in 1815, but the packet service out of Halifax was so expensive that it was mostly only government correspondence. Foster wrote at length to her brother in Dublin about the delays in postal traffic. We had the pleasure of receiving my beloved mother's letter of August the 14th, which came, we supposed, by the Dublin, which vessel arrived in Quebec lately. We've not yet heard of the box of books, but I suppose they're on the way up. We do not expect the August mail for some time yet. So that letter tells me that the, the mail to Quebec was taking a few months to cross the Atlantic, which is what you would expect. The expense of letters, of course, often solicited commentary. So McConnell Johnson left Antrim Town in 1848 after being released from jail for debt. And once he was in Upper Canada, he wrote letters of remorse to his wife, Jane. I still have confidence in myself and the providence of God that he will protect and support you and make me what I have not yet been a good and providing husband. More practical concerns motivated him to send instructions in December 1848. Dearest Jane, don't forget to post pay your letter. As if it is not, it will not arrive as there is a dispute between the Americans and British about the letters. Unless they are prepaid, they will not send them in writing. Say many things in few words, so I will get more news. Mail to, from, and within Ireland further complicated this system, designed because every route was linked to Dublin. Uh, this is a researcher named uh, G. Prendeville who, who did some work on this and reminded readers that there's, there was an uh, administrative upheaval resulting from the uneasy merger of local postal authorities um, with British state regulators after the Act of Union. And after 1801, there was a perception among British postmasters that early 19th century Irish letters might spread sedition. So one can imagine that regularizing the mail according to British guidelines was not perceived among the Irish as an act of benevolence, but perhaps surveillance and control. When I think of the way that transatlantic correspondence uh, in the archives has been so crucial to the foundation of Canadian history, right? This is this is where I, you know, certainly what got me interested in it, and to a nationalized Canadian literary consciousness then I really think we need to insist on the fact that the production of that corpus of material in the archives is determined by socio-technical apparatus like this haphazard postal system um, in disparate geographical locations, and then further determined by the vagaries of weather, geopolitics, bureaucracy, human error, and shipwrecks. So understandably, a letter that did reach its recipient was highly treasured, but much of the correspondence that was created and which survives was left by those who had literacy and paper, like O'Brien, or who had money and um, social networks to get it home, like O'Brien. The people with the means to successfully convey a letter were much more likely, of course, to be Anglo-Irish or part of the predominantly Protestant waves of migration before 1847. Looking for concrete evidence then of the ways in which urban rural or rural peasantry made use of the postal services in Ireland, uh, scholar Prendeville finds scant evidence but cites one example from the diary of Humphrey O'Sullivan, the hedge schoolmaster, who describes Gaelic speakers mailing in a community petition to try to gain voice um, within Anglophone political structures in 1828. It's not an individually authored letter. And this single example comes from letters written within Ireland. Outside of Ireland, 
there's one letter uh, sent from Mrs. Thomas Welch in Brockville, Upper Canada, to a Mr. Hunter in Ireland. And for me, this is one tiny shred of evidence about the correspondence of those without connections or literacy. So it's a dictated letter with really uncertain syntax and no punctuation. And it reads, Mrs. Welch, who is the letter writer, Mrs. Welch wants to know if you are Margaret Gage's son, if you are, will you oblige me by writing a few lines to me to let me know if she went home, she was married to Daniel Hunter, a soldier of the 4th Regiment of Foot. He died in Sydney, Australia. I am Margaret Gage's sister. Be good enough to write it once and let me know if she ever went home. So it's a really heartbreaking attempt to find someone. The privacy of individuation which we often assume of letters, that, that, it, that it's going to be individually authored, uh, makes us imagine them as being private, interpersonal dialogue. But that, I think, is belied by letters like the one I just read or the one from the Gaelic speakers. It relies on a community of readers and writers. And of course, lots of letters went missing. So when English bluestocking Anna Jameson visited Canada in 1836, she saw a huge pile of unclaimed letters at Brantford in the post office, left by immigrants too poor to retrieve them. So entire histories have gone missing with those letters, with those lost archives. Um, in response then, it seems to me scholars should focus on the material conditions of these journal letters and their circulation to recall that Empire is a series of historically and materially contingent networks right, that, that sort of connect these disparate um, localities. So the connection between postal system and empire is explained in an editorial in the Toronto's Globe and Mail in 1848. It claimed that the desire for a better postal system was prompted by a growing conviction that the social and commercial interests of the colonies were intimately connected with the extension of their postal intercourse and that they truly regarded it as a means in a new country of extending civilization. Uh, Laura Ishiguru has written this great um, new book on letters written from British Columbia back to the UK, just came out last year. She argues that um, British postal reform signals the importance of, of letter writing and its circulation as a key practice of, col of colonialism. Tentative networks of postal routes could only help British immigrants imagine these new territories as colonial spaces and extensions of British, uh, British land. And it really did contribute to sort of a discourse of imperial domestification, which is um, a term from Tricia Luton's. The personal letter of the Irish immigrant, I think, might register differently within that British framework of uh, colonialism. So to investigate colonial intimacies through the personal letter and the diary writing of the Irish diaspora might offer us a way to trace resistant ways of living. It can potentially, I think, map hidden histories and affects that won't or can't recede. Um, one of these circuits of exchange, of course, was the Hudson's Bay Company. And as I said, I've written and thought about that uh, just recently. Uh, correspondence was crucial to the operations of that behemoth um, enterprise. Fur trade voyagers were indispensable in facilitating pre-colonial and colonial postal systems. The HBC, which was headquartered in London, was really the de facto government for a massive section of North America, from the Arctic Circle down to San Francisco Bay. Only 1% of the men stationed with the HBC were Irish. So it's remarkable that when uh, Canadian researcher Helen Buss and her colleagues found a cache of dead letters from the HBC, um, there was a, a nice big chunk from a man from Cork, Ireland named Jonathan Buck. And he's got 14 letters that were written to him, but undelivered. Buck worked as a second mate on the ship Columbia, which made excursions to British Columbia, Oregon, um, California and Hawaii, and that probably made it tricky to know where to find him, right? Um, one letter is is addressed to Jonathan Buck, Esquire, Esquire, HBC's Bark, Columbia, Columbia River, or elsewhere. So that covers all of your, covers all of the um, possibilities. 
These letters arrived via Her Majesty's service and were uh, routed via the uh, Office of Public Works in Dublin. And the news he did not receive is heartbreaking. Um, this was a letter from Henry Ridgway, who says, a short time ago, I wrote to Mr. Smith, the agent, to the Hudson's Bay Company at his office at Threadneedle Street, London, to know whether you were living or not and where you were when they last heard, and he informed me that you were well and on board one of their ships at Columbia River. I now write a few lines to tell you of your family. Your mother sends a letter with this, which will also inform you, your father died last September, and your brother Nick also a few days after him of the cholera morbus, which complaint raged here in Ireland and England this last summer and autumn, very severely, and took away rich and poor without distinction. And then he asks, he says, I can't look after your family, please come home. Even though this letter never found its proper recipient, readers can see clearly the emotional geography it maps out. Grief, desperation, anxiety. Letters like Ridgway's highlight the sociocultural dimensions of emotion and I think usefully demonstrate the way in which intimacy is integral to understanding colonial expansion. By this, I mean rereading the interpersonal interactions activated by letters helps contemporary readers see intimate moments enmeshed with macro histories of belonging, displacements, and dispossession. So Jane White, uh, and uh, th she's the one that I wrote uh, um, the paper on that was published last summer. She emigrated with her family from Newtonards to Goderich, Upper Canada in 1849 and wrote to her friend Eleanor Wallace, who re remained in Newtonards from 1849 until her death in 1869. Her letters are at the Provincial Records Office of Northern Ireland. No return letters from Eleanor have been found in Canada, perhaps because Jane never married and had no family. But the affective ties, affective, which instigated their correspondence and perhaps prompted Eleanor to cherish the letters as objects, exemplifies how the emigrant letter was not only a channel of information, but more often a channel of solidarity and consolation. So Jane writes to Eleanor, I wish I had you to walk beside. I would like one of those long walks with you up the Belfast road, sometimes when alone, and I begin to think, I often wish for my old home. As one scholar notes, these letters possess a physical authority rooted in the closeness of the writer's body a form of bodily trace that underwrites and sometimes dominates its text. So Jane's letter, what's interesting about her set of letters is the very first one of that set gets reprinted quite often in um, histories of the famine because her very first letter documents a, an arrival at Gros Eel in June of 1849. But Jane was not impoverished. She watched um, the lower classes go off to the quarantine sheds while she had a picnic in the wood with her servants. So she's she's not having a typical experience. And the rest of her letters, of course, don't reflect or or think about a you know a famine history whatsoever. So Jane White uses, I think, the bulk of her correspondence with Eleanor as a vehicle to rehearse a Protestant and middle class identity that she feels she needs to double down on in upper well, what was then Canada West. Those identity affiliations act like connective tissue to the land of her birth, and she reinforces them in letter writing. Um, and to me, that seems to be a sign of these uneven processes of, of colonialization. She's very nostalgic for those old identities. She never feels fully settled in Upper Canada. She really never feels like she belongs. She's encountering a lot of pan-Irish prejudice where she's living in Goderich. And I think that gives her more reason to hold on to that middle class identity. In 1858, uh, there's a letter that year in which she condemns the widespread, quote, cheating and roguery of settler culture. But at the same time, her local newspaper is reporting on a group of Irish Protestants who were involved in a riot that resulted in injuries to Catholics and to the destruction of a Catholic pub really close to where she was. The newspaper notes that the list of men held to bail comprises all of the well-known Protestant Irish names of the area, Stanleys, Hodgins, Callinghams, et cetera, et cetera. And those 
con that 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 tension that was there that is the start of the tension that's going to lead to the Donnelly disaster uh, of southern Ontario a few decades later. So she knew this story. Like, there's no way Jane missed this story, but she did, of course, did not write about it. The Irish Protestants involved in roguery do not get mentioned in her letters at all. She has really harsh judgments about many, many people around her. And I think, um, you know, it can be a sign of what one scholar names rogue intensities, the affective elements of settler experiences, which are unsayable because they represent everything left unframed by the dominant stories of what her life is supposed to look like. And her, her snottiness, her haughtiness in these letters, I think is really poignant because there's evidence to say that their, that family was not prosperous in Goderich. She was really struggling. So the discomfort evident in White's letters often offers a kind of entry point to more precise descriptions about the work of settler colonialism and what participation looks like for those who are adjacent to, maybe not immersed in the goals of empire. And what it means to belong or not belong to a home and to normative institutions of nation states. So there's another uh, big set of letters from a Dublin born woman named Frances Stewart. She wrote letters home after she emigrated with her Belfast born husband in 1822. And they settled on the lands of the uh, Mishisagig people near what is now Peterborough, Ontario. These were published in 1889 as Our Forest Home. One of her correspondents was Mariah Edgeworth. So she was, you know, very well, very well situated. And in these letters, she rehearses old prejudices about religion. So she's writing here in with this letter, she's writing to Catherine Partrail, who's one of our, we call them the literary grandmothers of Canadian lit. Writes to Ka uh, Catherine Partrail. And she says, we are at present very quiet here and seem out of the reach of harm. Those surrounded by Roman Catholics who are doing everything they can to take the lead and have an upper hand in every public establishment and no doubt all are Fenian, but I hope may be kept down quietly. In an earlier letter, she singles out Catholics from the south of Ireland for particular condemnation. She says, certainly the Southern Irish Catholics are the worst everywhere. And often if they do not get on for a time, they do something dishonest, which sends them to jail and so to ruin. Then she dwells on the superior work habits of Scotch people whose hard work and, uh, you know, it helps them be very superior. And then she talks about one anomaly, an Irish family from the north who managed to overcome their, their difficulties and, their, and the disadvantages of being papists and very bigoted ones too. She goes on to write, wherever Protestant settlers are, they certainly do thrive best, but they must be of sober, steady, industrious habits. So she's really aligning herself with colonial goals, I think, of hard work, nation building. Um, and for her, that means you have to denigrate a whole set of Irish settlers. And I want to turn now to, to um, a discussion, believe it or not, of pianos, because Jane White gets really attached to a piano that she has, and it's stuck out to me in the letters. And I think it can help us think about the meaning and significance of objects, perhaps, for, for the emigrants. The letters, letter journals, playing cards, bodies, pianos, they're all objects put into circulation through diasporic movements. Movements that bring into sharp focus, you know, the transnational complications of identity. The Whites brought a piano and a servant from Ireland, suggesting that they were really well off in Belfast, in Newton Arts. And the piano proves to be a useful, useful tool for Jane because she uses it to show her middle class status. She's very proud of it. Her opinion about a local piano teacher is revealing. The only one competent to teach is Mrs. Charlesworth, but she charges four pound per quarter. I never would give instructions of the kind to anyone. I could do it just as well as her. I soon snapped anyone who asked me for lessons. So she's being very haughty as usual. The following year, Jane returns to the subject, telling Eleanor that there was a tuner up from London this summer who pronounced my very old piano the most substantial he had seen. The piano brought from Ireland, allegedly better than any in the region, is a physical reminder of the life she left behind. In a related coincidence, 
Mariah Edgeworth sent a piano to Francis Stewart in 1827 so that Francis too would have a physical emblem of her middle class status. And that piano was delivered by horse drawn sleigh over the snow, fell through a pond, fell in through the ice into a pond, got dragged back out, uh, delivered to Francis Stewart, and believe it or not, just got donated last year to a high school in Peterborough. So it still it still exists. So Jane invests the meaning in this object of the piano. Um, and there is a testimony of things that I think we can think about because it offers resources for rethinking the liberal humanist view of the self or that privileged 19th century subject writing letters often rooted in the privacy of individuation that we take for granted. Whitlock, Jillian Whitlock notes that things become particularly meaningful in the life experiences of refugees or asylum seekers in the 20th century and 21st century who are pushed to the margins of citizenship or others who are imagined as unwelcome strangers threatening the body of the nation. So was Jane that kind of unwelcome stranger? I think she's insisting on a Protestant identity because she knew she's not easily distinguishable from a Catholic settler. And when you consider the fact that the Catholics were prevented from voting in the provinces until the 1830s, you can see how I think some Irish immigrants would have perceived themselves as having a tenuous hold on full and active citizenship in the early 19th century. And when you consider the fact that the Catholic Church in the provinces and territories was deeply concerned about the material well-being of its parishioners because wealthier Protestants were going to step in and supply the needs of impoverished Catholics and then thereby gain access to proselytizing, you can see that stuff, I think, acquired a new meaning among Irish immigrants. In this context of threatened disenfranchisement and of material goods that arrive loaded with ideology or theology, kind of like soup in the famine, it seems reasonable that other things, letters, diaries, papers, pianos, might signify differently. Even for those whose Protestant Irish middle class identity, and maybe, and especially for those maybe who, whose identity might be mistaken for something else. So consider finally this description of Irish immigrant John Monaghan in Susanna Moody's Roughing It in the Bush, and that is the urtext of Canadian pioneer memoirs said to be the foundation for Canadian literature. That big of a deal for us. Moody immigrates with an influx, she's English, she immigrates with an influx of Irish immigrants in 1832, most on their way to Toronto and Coburg. And her general opinions of the Irish are everything you might expect from a prejudiced upper middle class English woman who's fallen on hard times. One whole chapter of her memoir is de dedicated to John, who she describes as a proud and poor man with a strong Irish brogue. An epigraph to the chapter describes, um, sorry, romanticizes his disenfranchisement by appealing to personified nature. Hast thou not room for, the ne for thy neglected son? A stern necessity has driven him forth alone and friendless. So John appears at the Moody's door one night, quote, a strange, wild looking lad, barefooted and with no other covering to his head than the thick matted locks of raven, raven blackness that hung like a cloud over his swarthy, sunburnt visage. The Moody Scottish maid Isabel becomes hysterical, calling him a papist vagabond, set to rob and murder all of them. And John protests, explaining he is a Protestant who was left at a Belfast as asylum in a basket as a child with a label around me neck. And that doesn't, you know, like in no way does that sound like a Belfast accent to me. Um, John is impoverished and begins doing odd jobs for the Moody's to eke out a living. He has only one suit of clothes. One day he asks Susanna Moody if he can launder his shirt, which has become really filthy. And she describes the washing that, ens that ensues. It's just a comedy of soap suds and sweating, which amounts to nothing. So Susanna Moody gives him a hand-me-down shirt from her husband. She reports, quote, no peacock was ever prouder of his tail than the wild Irish lad was of this old suit. And I'm not sure if Moody knew this, but at the same moment, there were Irish laborers working, in, uh, working on the Rideau Canal in Quebec who were given the nickname bas de soie, or silk stockings, to make fun of their poor clothing. 
So it's this metonymic, you know, uh, substitution of person for clothing. John Monahan's pride is described at first as comedic and later a liability when he quits working for the Moody's. And Susanna describes the core issue. Quote, like most spoiled children, she writes, he was a little too fond of having his own way, which is an opinion decidedly at odds with her first description of him as a neglected son. This rhetorical gesture of configuring a group of people as both spoiled and neglected can be found in portrayals of Indigenous people in Canada, including in Susanna Moody's own writing. John is reduced, like them, to an incompetent other. Uh, and this link between, you know, just to go back to that link between representations of Irish and Indigenous peoples, um, it's been explained more thoroughly in the American context by a woman named Mary Mullen. And I think there's some interesting, there's some interesting thinking to be done there about, um, and, uh, and the name of her article is, how the Irish became indigenous. So John is described as a peacock, a child, literally a thing in a basket with a label, and he does not get to tell his side of the tale. So if Irish laborers are equated to silk stockings, and if John is described as a thing, the question we have to ask is how does one speak through the silence of objectification in a colonial system? What shapes a person's evaluation of material objects if they themselves are being described in that way and regarded that way? How does one speak within the logics of racial and gendered exclusion that historically cir circumscribes access to citizenship in colonial British North America? How does one inscribe a life in the dialogue of correspondence when access to individuation, pen, literacy, paper, the postal system, and full citizenship are all fraught in so many ways. So the context of, of the, the content that we find in those emigrant letters, absolutely important, no question, um, in part because I think they show these affective economies that are existing in tandem with uncertain citizenship, and that I think is quite interesting. But the letter or the diary itself as a physical object, I think has to be highlighted in the analysis and any analysis that contextualizes their scarcity. Irish letters written before 1850 faced all the difficulties I've outlined and then additional challenges if the letter made it to Ireland. Secondly, their scarcity speaks to the ongoing need to decolonize the archive and the stories it has preserved. Thirdly, I think material analysis would draw attention to the historically nuanced relationship between postal participation and colonial expansion. Taken together, these observations might convince readers to resituate letters and diaries at the site of production. And then that gives you a way, I think, to imagine the agency of the historical subject and the unique object that they create or cherish. The letter and diary are life writing practices shaped and determined by material, affective, and colonial contexts. And as life writing objects, they leave historically significant material traces. So just one last observation here, and then and then I'm very eager to hear um, to hear your thoughts. Canadian archivist Linda Mora reminds scholars that how materials circulate and what role they perform in relation to shifting affective economies is pivotal to the understanding and constitution of social categories and to the identities of persons, institutions, communities, and nations. So I'm hoping that I, I'm hoping to work towards a critical approach that will perhaps begin to acknowledge the way that the material form of transatlantic correspondence in the pre-Confederation period has has some significance within those shifting affective economies. And perhaps we can start to imagine a new vocabulary that will articulate both the process and the precarity of creating social categories and identities for 19th century Irish immigrants as they contribute to the nascent formulation of the nation state that we now call Canada. That's it. So much for seeing a fascinating paper. Uh, do you want to sit down? What would yes, be best? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be away from here.
we can move everything across. It's always tricky for me to find ways of receiving feedback when the work is not particularly English literature and it's not particularly history and it's a, it's a collection of a whole lot of things. So I'm always eager to hear what kind of feedback um, people can Great. people can imagine and offer. So we can take questions from the room and also if you're online, um, you can either kind of type a question into the chat box or raise your hand electronically and I'll ask you to, to ask a question. But we're going to start with Ava in the next. Oh. Thank you. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, there's one category of object that I'm really eager to mention. What's you that? Talked about, you talked about paper. What about pens and pencils? Right, right. OK, so <clears throat> that gets a whole paragraph in another article that I've written because the Hudson's Bay Company archives are full of these journals and they were mandated journals. They were told to keep the journals. Um, they were supplied with paper. There's a whole long list about how the HBC came up and gave them paper and told them what to write on this paper. No mention of the quills. So what, what we think has happened is that it would have been um, uh, the Indigenous people who were who were helping them, who were, you know, anyone lower than an HBC man probably was creating quills on the spot. But the fact that it never, ever gets mentioned everywhere, anywhere, like, or the fact that as you're portaging a canoe, that is what's giving you time to write in your journal, and you're not the one doing the portaging. There's, it's that kind of um, lacuna, right? That it's just telling me that there's those other actors have historical agency, and we're contributing to this, to the material culture that we now have. But unless you're kind of looking for those holes, it's not, it's not entirely obvious. So yes, right, the quills. I'm assuming they made the quills on site. They would have made the quills once they got there. Yes, yes, they would have had to make their own ink. And in fact, Susanna Moody talks about that, um, the different methods she had of making inks from natural materials that she found around her uh, her place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sean? Yeah, um, this whole notion of the, the diary letter is, is fascinating. The one thing we didn't say very much about is who they're addressed to. Who are the recipients? Okay, right. That makes a huge difference. I mean, if you're going to make trouble to produce a bulky document, presumably, is is it like the sort of round robin letters? Yes. Day at Christmas. Is it yes. Going to be yes. That's going to be like content. Absolutely. If you're going to read about the whole thing on the circle and the neighbors, then you're going to be much less frank about um, actual um, you know, events in your own life, possibly uh, comments you make with other people and so on. And there's also the issue. If you're giving people who are not literate, uh, isn't that being really different for them by somebody? And at the other end, is it being read for them by, by the recipient for the recipients by somebody? I've certainly there are priests quoted in the Devon Commission in the 1840s saying, uh, yes, I know all my enemies because I'm regularly called on to read out the letters they send back to their parents. So I mean there's a whole question here of who's actually receiving them and how that structure is what's ending. Yeah, and, and so most of the evidence that I've found suggested that it was more like a broadcast, right? So and and on on the on the front sheet it will say like, you know, it might start in England, but then you could cross off that address and it would go to the next one, the next one, the next one. So you just circulated this one object through um your whole extended family. You're quite right. Um and then that's a really interesting question about who was able to um intercede when you had people who were not literate. I'm trying to remember where I heard this recently, but there was, you know, I think by by about the 1840s, there would be one person in each small Irish community who could be a reader of English. So um, they were at least you would have one person in a village, probably, as you say, maybe the priest would be a good candidate. Oh, right. Who who could be that person that you would take the letter to them and say, please read this to me. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, Yes, and and when I think of when I think of how Canadian history has has just really taken these at face value, that's what really struck me is that mm -mm, there's a whole other social history I think lurking just below the the surface that needs to be imagined as well as we can. Yeah, please. Yeah, it's interesting what Sean said. Fascinating, lovely. Thank you. Um, with, with regard to literacy uh, and dictated, you, you quoted one letter with, with that was dictated. Yes. Uh, proportionately, you know, I, I mean, there's one about the person, the recipients who, who can read, but also how, how many of them do you, 
you know, have you come across that would be dictated as opposed to be, be written? I mean, is there any kind of, you, you know, and even does that indicate, obviously, indicates social class and, you know, obviously the lady that you referred to was, you know, uh, uh, from a more wealthy class, you know. So, so were there many, many dictated as opposed to, because obviously it, it's different the way it's written as well. Yes. Yeah, it's really... It makes it more poignant for me somehow to see the, to see them, you know, desperately holding on to the bit of literacy that they have to get this letter, you know, out into the world. No, I haven't actually found many of them. I really haven't. And I suspect it's because they perhaps would have ended up in on certain places. Like they didn't always like this. It's part of the fact that they just didn't even know where some of their people were. It's much easier for, um, middle class and upper class people to have the certain community that they know is still there. And that one letter that I quoted, she just doesn't even know where that her people have gone. Um, so that's that is another complicating factor. You know, and and another really heartbreaking aspect of the impact of poverty, right? That that you, you usually lose your community, you lose your your people. It's, it's almost like you know thinking contemporary, you know about someone writes into a show and they're trying to track somebody down and it's desperate, you know, or somebody was maybe raised in a bag of the laundry or something, you know, there's something yeah. like that kind of desperate search, isn't there? Yeah. yeah, there is. That's right. I should go back. It's probably <clears throat> linked to what you're saying. I used to live in St. John, New Brunswick. Ah. So there's obviously a massive island of St. John, New Brunswick, where there was quarantines and the University of Brunswick coming huge exhibition. Yes. So he came through and ended up there. Um, you know, the list of people getting on the ships in the area and that was something like that. But no, but I, to my recollection, there was no mention of any letters or anything that went to the quarantines at Ireland. So I was yeah. curious, are people quarantined based on whether they were steerage or whether they were, she mentioned the lady who was on Having a picnic. Mm -hmm. And have you come across any of those letters from the quarantine? No, which is why I think Jane White's letter gets trotted out so often. You know, at least she's at least she is Irish. She's a better eyewitness than Susanna Moody. Susanna Moody writes about gross eel as well. Um so she's she, okay, so she's a marginally better eyewitness because she is Irish, but she's not having that experience of and for, as I understand it, what happened was um a doctor would come on board and sort of do a preliminary evaluation of who needed to go to the sheds and who didn't. Um, so I don't think everybody it would, and of course it was primarily steerage who would go to off to the quarantine sheds. I don't think everybody went there. I think some of the boats, some yeah, I've read about some of them that got actually a clear pass. Like if there was no one on board who was sick, they would get the all clear and could keep going. Um, yeah, I but no I, letters. Let me back and just add something about that. Um, Sir Henry Gore Booth's immigrants who he assists to St. John New oh, Brunswick. Yeah. They write back to him. Some of them have been through Partridge Island. Mm -hmm. um, and that, those letters are submitted to the UK Parliament as evidence in support of his case for further assisted emigration. So they are, again, letters from very poor mm -hmm. people who are privileged because of that intervention uh, by, by the landowner, obviously collecting them from the relatives or copies of them from the mm -hmm. relatives as they arrive back in County Sligo in, in 1840-48. That's great. But they're very unusual, as you say. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't found a lot, no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah, I, I, I very much want to get out to their archives because I know there's a lot more there. Again, many more letters that are at UNB. Mm-hmm. Sophie. Wow. Within with um, female relief started. Um, so I was very good. Really what part of America? Like um, largely Chicago, but some of them are to New York, but also to to Australia. Well. Okay, good. So it's about there's not the Okay. Um, but um, my question was about oh yeah, these intersections of different technologies. So you sometimes get in Australia um newspapers saying. We've got all these letters just waiting at the post office. So if you, even if you're not anywhere near Melbourne, uh, like 
can you send someone to pick up a letter? Mm. We we'll would just send it to the post office in Melbourne. And then all these settlers elsewhere would read the newspaper and then know to go. So I was just wondering if you ever come across anything like that. Um, but also I was really interested in how you were saying about how Irish people are, are kind of materialised themselves. Um, and I was just wondering if you think that's anything to do with the kind of uh, use of cartoons and images mm -hmm. rather than because people can click into those stereotypes quite quickly, even if they can't read. Mm hmm. I hadn't thought about that either. Um, I, yeah, I like both of those ideas. I know I haven't looked in newspapers to see if there's those kinds of interventions happening in Canada at the same time. That's a really good question. Right, of course. What year is that, that that you're seeing that happen? That early? Okay, that's good. Okay, that's really interesting. No, thank you. Those are both those are both things that I'll follow up on. That's great. Um, so we've got Patrick waiting very patiently online. Patrick Duffy. Patrick, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yep. Can you hear me? Uh, you can't see me. Just, yeah, so yes. Want, uh, amplify the volume a little bit here. Uh, oops. OK, go ahead, Patrick. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Um, can you just remind me of who was the person who wrote about the Southern Irish Catholics? And when you mentioned the Scots, did they refer to people who emigrated directly from Scotland or from what we would now term Ulster Scots from uh, Presbyterians in the north of Ireland? And one thing I'm interested in is I look at what well, I tried to establish to what extent do Protestants in Southern Ulster, due to their exposure, Catholic movements form this Ulster Protestant identity in, in opposition to um, Catholic Ireland. Is there any evidence from exposure, even people from inner Ulster, Antrim, Down, Derry, etc., from being exposed to Southern Catholics in Canada? I know this is a this is a bit of a stretch, but is there any any evidence to suggest that they're, they're, they're import or they're exporting this idea of Ulster Protestantism versus Irish Catholicism back home. That might be a bit of a stretch, but I just <laughs> Did everybody hear that question well enough? OK. Um, yeah, so the name of the person that and I think you would be interested in reading her letters. It's Frances Stewart. And yep. the, the book is Our Forest Home, published 1889. Um, but the letters themselves are from much earlier in the in the century. And your question is about in what sense did they sort of produce an Ulster Scott identity in Upper Canada and ship it back. I think I, th I think I would say yes, that I think that that was part of what was happening. And when she talks about Scotch, the Scotch identity, I think she's thinking Ulster, what we would call Ulster Scots. That's, that's pretty, that seems pretty clear to me. Um, yeah, and, and I think one of the things that's happening with the prejudice that you can see in these Irish letters in Canada is is a reinforcing and a rearticulation about the the good Irish versus the bad Irish in Canada, and that that perhaps was instigated by what I was talking about, feeling like th that other settlers may not recognize the differences between Irish, different kinds of Irish, um, that there was very much a pan-Irish prejudice even though there were like a lot of Irish settlers there, like the Irish settlers outnumbered English and Scottish settlers for a great part of the 19th century. So it was predominantly Irish. Um, but there's not a sense in, that I can read that there was a lot of differentiation among non-Irish. So the, the Irish are doing that themselves yeah. to distinguish between uh, who they think should be colonizing this new land and who they think should not be. So thanks very much. Patrick, let's go to Liam next. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, yes, thank you. I'll be seeing my Christmas letters in the new light. <laughs> I'm just interested in the theme of settler colonialism. Yes. And I'm just wondering, to whom do you apply a particular label? 
Yeah. Um, presumably Irish immigrants who take land. What about um, Irish labourers working on canals, for instance, other infrastructure projects? Would they qualify as colonial settlers? Yeah, so um, th thank you. That's a really good question because uh, I didn't feel like I had the room to sort of get into all of that. I think there are significant differences for Irish settlers, right? Like I think that whole the project of settler colonialism and 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 the the definition that I use for settler colonialism is the one from Patrick Wolfe, where he talks about it as an ongoing structure, that it's not an event. That it's 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 an ongoing structure that is part and parcel of colonial places like Canada, and it's interesting to think about how did that get formulated in the first place? Who was doing the formulating? I think it's like any his like any historical undertaking. The truth is is surely more uneven and nuanced than easy colonial histories would have us believe. Um, that not everyone felt that they were immersed in this project of colonialism. They would have been. That's it. That's it. Like exactly. And and yet, in retrospect, we sort of we sort of tar everyone in the nineteenth century often with that brush to say they were all involved with settler colonialism, um, and well, with colonialism, and not everyone had access to. The tools, the as you as you say, if you're an Irish laborer, you don't have the same kind of access to reproducing colonial structures, especially when those very colonial structures may have been the thing that got you out of Ireland in the first place. You know, I think I just think it's more complicated, and others here may have more to say about that than I do. Um, but yeah, I think I think it is just is a more complicated project than people like to believe, which is why for me this the, looking at the case study is is always a good like you can just if you can ground yourself in one particular emigrant and how they're how they're understanding the world and where they're placed, that to me at least gives me some levers to talk about what their process of settling looked like, which I think is highly individual. Question. No, no, not that I've ever found <clears throat> that, which is interesting given the the American history, right? So, no, nope, not that I don't remember anything like that. You're right. I've never, no, stumbled across the like the only reference to money. Um, may have been in that letter that I quoted where he said make sure you pay all the postage so that it gets here like they, they would talk about how much the post will cost but they don't talk about money you're right that's interesting That would be my guess is that they like a lot is certainly in the period before 1850. It's so rough in Canada that you're you just don't have methods of making a ton of money unless you are, you know, a, um, a Scottish capitalist living in Montreal, which is a whole other set of that's a whole other set of settlers. If those aren't the you know, those aren't the Irish um, migrants. Yeah. You would think so, but I have never, I've never looked that up. Um, you would think so. I'm going to check. Thank you. Actually, one thing about that was that uh, we just had somebody deposited some letters from us just before the First World War uh, from a uh, uh, great grand uncle who was a uh, Presbyterian minister. Mm -hmm. And went out there and then came back to serve in the war and then went back to Canada again. Uh, where are, are there many from missionaries, you know, either Catholic or Protestant churches, or you know, does it, does it, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, you know, the whole, you know, because you, you, somebody mentioned clerics, so mm -hmm. you, just, you just wonder how have, have you come across? No, but you're reminding me that there's all sorts of 
very specific archives attached to churches yeah. in Canada that I that I should go look at. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. You're right because they would have. They're going to have a whole other set of of stories there that may, in fact, answer your question. That's good. That's really good. That's excellent. So that's Roddy, R-O-D-D-Y? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. In a different way. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we have a few comments from, from people online. Um, so from Karen Corrigan, uh, she found your paper very interesting. She's interested in exploring issues of language and dialect in these materials. Mm. Um, she's done some work with Emma Morton. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not really a question. Um, uh, but her experience here is, is similar to yours. Very important to take an interdisciplinary approach. I'd very much like to follow this up with, with by email. Oh, excellent. And Karen will be emailing you about that. Oh, good. Lovely. Um, and then from uh, Michelle McParland, uh, as a Canadian living and studying here in Ireland, currently I've learned more about the histories of both countries, the steep learning curve during my undergraduate dissertation, mm -hmm. and the colonial commonalities between the Indigenous Irish here during the settlement and the Canadian Indigenous during the establishment of Canada, the yeah. issue of the Irish played in that, the colonial Irish problem and, and the Indian problem. This has given me another rabbit hole to run down, so thank you. Yeah. Um, and then comment from um, uh, SD Escara, some Indigenous scholars, i.e. Bird, differentiate between settlers and Arivant, a uh, concept borrowed uh, from Kamal Brithwit. Yes, that's the, right. That's ringing the bell. Yeah, the, right, right, right. The area. Yep. Well, that's excellent. Those are all lovely, lovely, helpful comments. Well, just a moment, but it's like, that'd be very not to just apply the American one to Canada. Exactly. It's Protestants who become settlers in the land, the Irish college, and that's heavily concentrated in the cities. But I mean, Gordon Darrop's. Um, Analysis of the Bain Centre on Ontario census shows that the, the the most successful ethnic group in terms of occupying land, being owners of land, not tenants, being farmers, not labourers, are the Irish, ahead of the English mm -hmm. and ahead of the Scots, and with only a marginal difference between Catholics and the Royalists. So it's quite yeah. a different setup. So if you're going yes. to say the bad set, bad cult settlers and good anyone. Um, and Donald Akinson says the same thing in his work, his 84 work, which is that he, he figures that historians in the U.S. have done a better job of talking about the importance of Irish migration and how foundational it was to the U.S. And he said there were more of them in Canada. So why do we not have the same narrative in Canada? And he suspects either it's because they did a such that, that that those Irish farmers were successful and did such a good job of integrating that we've lost sight of it. Um, so he's he was trying to come up with reasons right then. He said, "How is it that we have never had this magnum opus of the Irish in Canada the way that you would have in a similar state or you know if we were just doing Ontario because he was just doing Ontario? Where is that history? And it is different." Um, and he he just thinks the Americans did a better job of of uh, narrativizing that experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Or, or maybe Ulysses S. Grant, even right. He was where's where's he from? Oh, Ma, that's right. That's right. I thought I knew it was somewhere in the yeah. So like yeah, but those um, in Canada, the the I would say the general consensus is more that we were shaped by Scottish Presbyterian um, values and ethos coming through, like a John A. Macdonald or you know the, that kind of thing. So so you're right. It may be at the governmental level that some of those narratives have taken hold. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we're not. Sorry. Yes, please. 
because they were broke. Like the, because uh, I think either they fell on hard times, like Susanna Moody's family fell on hard times. They had to migrate. That was really their only option. Um, I can't remember what Francis Stewart's reason was, but there are often reasons like they just thought they would be able to um, better themselves. Like this is clearly the story with Jane White's family. They were doing well in Belfast. They were doing well. So it was a sense that they could do even better if they got to Canada. Um, and they had read all of the propaganda that was being circulated. And I know that the 1820s was a really high watermark for propaganda about Canada that circulated throughout the UK um, and into Ireland. And I think I think that had an effect on a lot of people who said, like, Families he would think of as middle or upper class saying, yeah, let's let's go take our chance and see what happens. Um, Michelle, who's online, has been waiting to ask a question. Michelle, do you want to unmute yourself and, and go ahead? Yeah, just thank you very much for a um, fantastic and informative presentation. I'm I'm a 19th century scholar out in Alberta and I was oh. just geeking out at everything <laughs> I do. I I teach Canadian literature um, and I was just fascinated with it. I was wondering, um, are you going back beyond um, the 1820s to the um, 18th century? Because um, I'm imagining you're still getting some of the same challenges in terms of getting letters back overseas. You're getting a substantial amount of, of wealthy Irish settlers in in um, the Maritimes in Eastern Canada that um, that uh, Edward, Lord Edward Fitzgerald recorded in his letters from Canada. So I don't know if there are other pockets of them. I've, I've, I've spent a fair bit of time in the National Library of Ireland looking at Fitzgerald's letters from mostly from Quebec and St. John's. And I'm just wondering if there's other people of the same class. It'd probably be more administrators than people we'd considered settlers. But of course, the, the letters were the prime way of running the empire, basically. Mm -hmm. Where where are you in Alberta? I have to ask. Oh, I'm at Mount Royal University. Oh, very good. Okay, yeah. Um, no, I haven't gone back before 1801, and I think my my sense was a bit like yours that it would be a lot more of the administrators at that time, you know, um, government administrators. But but that's a really interesting question that I will think more about the the idea of. Um, what else there might be in the in the 18th century? Yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. And, and if I can just follow up, I'm, I'm just wondering to the extent with middle class writers, how much um, letter writing manuals are fitting in, because as you say, it's there's that belletristic thing where where they're kind of a combination of entertainment, intimate communication, um, something to be passed around or maybe even published. I don't know if that's. Definitely, yeah, and and that is something that I didn't even touch on, which is that the the, the um, understanding that publication was was a potential, right? This is certainly true for letter writers connected to the Hudson's Bay Company through the 18th century into the 19th century. They knew that there that there was a strong likelihood that their journals of exploration would be published. And of course, as you know, at Mount Royal, that's, you know, that's that's a huge spine of what we consider to be early Canadian literature. So that's definitely in the background. And then you're right, letter writing manuals as well. But it's often I haven't done the hard work to figure out which letter writing manuals circulated where and at which time and who knew what. You know, I haven't done that work myself. So. But but you're right, it's all there in the background. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, right, any other questions in the room? Yeah, want to ask. Thank you for the fantastic feedback. That's really helpful. That's you, really you've helpful. Left with us, left, left with us with this wonderful image, uh, Kate, of uh, this piano being right. kind of carded around. It's a great Jane Campion esque. <laughs> That's it, that, isn't it? Yeah. Of the piano kind of making the piano making its way around the empire, yeah. you know, bringing bringing civility and uh, class distinction. Yeah, and indeed, kind of ethnic distinction with it. So, thank you for that. If for nothing else, it's it's been a really fascinating paper, um, and I think we've all learned a lot from it. We've obviously, you know, had a lot of questions and, good, thank you. and, and uh, in the room as well. So, um, can we thank? I finish just by thanking yes. it in the normal fashion for very good thank you. Thank you.
Fantastic. Right. So uh, just before we finish, uh, we do have one final event, our studies event uh, this semester, which is next Monday, back to our usual slot, 4.30, but it will be a bit, be across in Lanyon G74. We're having a book launch, uh, which uh, Sean will speak at, uh, of my book on William Sharman Crawford and um, Sean Farrell's book on Thomas Drew and the making of Victorian Belfast. There will be drinks and there will be snacks at that. So if for no other reason, do come and join us 4.30 next Monday, the 11th of December uh, over uh, in Lanya G74. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thank you. Give you a card, Kate. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, yeah.